Greg Milano, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks, John. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm super excited for this conversation. We're going to be exploring long-term versus short-term orientation and how we as leaders can lead strategically and shift more towards that long-term approach. I think, especially in Western cultures, we tend to really be drawn into short-term thinking, short-term orientation, and there's a lot for us to learn about looking around the corner, you know, into the future, so to speak, just, just by, you know, how we prepare and how we uh, strategically focus, you know, on a long-term perspective. As we get started, I wanted to share Greg's bio with everybody. Greg Milano is the founder and CEO of Fortuna Advisors. He has over 25 years of experience in value-based management as partner of Stern Stewart & Co., managing director and co-head of the Strategic Finance Group at Credit uh, Suisse. How do you say that? Suisse, Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse. Mm-hmm. And founder and CEO of Fortuna Advisors. He is a recognized industry leader in financial performance measurement and valuation, capital allocation, and incentive compensation. He is the author of Curing Corporate short term in Uh, short-termism, future growth versus current earnings, and his work is regularly published in the Journal of Applied Corporate Finance, CFO Magazine, Fortune, the Wall Street Journal, amongst many others. He earned an MBA from NYU Stern School of Business and a BS in mechanical engineering from, I'm not even sure how to say that one. um, Rensselaer. (laughs) <laughs> Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Wonderful. What a tremendous background. Pleasure to be with you. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background before we dive on in? Oh, uh, no. I think, you know, just the, my, my firm, Fortuna Advisors, um, you know, we're coming up on our 13 year anniversary now. And, you know, our focus, uh, which really builds on everything I've done in my career, uh, is, is really about helping companies become better versions of themselves and, and by embracing an ownership culture, what we call an authentic ownership culture where people think and act like long-term committed owners. So just to sort of establish, you know, bigger picture, what we're all about. Yeah. I love that. I love that focus. And I'm also all about helping both individuals as well as leaders of teams and whole organizations learn how to better function, be more effective, efficient, but also more authentic and more purpose-driven in the work that we do. And the reality is these are all integrated ideas, mm-hmm. right? A lot of yeah. times we talk about them in pieces and we pull them apart and that's important so we can get into detail, but they are all part of a big puzzle and they're integrated pieces that we have to also think about in conjunction. So I really like how you frame that, your kind of big picture approach um, in your firm. That's wonderful. So as we get started, Let's mm-hmm. start by really defining terms. Um, I, I think most people you know, know, at least intuitively, what we mean by short-term versus long-term. What do you mean specifically when you think about that? Uh, because on the one hand, you could say short-term this week, this quarter. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could say long-term five years. And then you go to some Asian cultures, and when they talk about long-term, they're talking 50 years, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so what do you mean by short-term versus long-term? Well, in the, in the context of, uh, of our services with our clients, we're trying to get people to think long-term by getting away from overemphasizing the next quarter or the next year. And so sort of three to five years is long-term. But, but I think it's important to establish up front that it's not great to be only long-term focused either. You know, when, I, when I've worked with entrepreneur owners that have run their business since the founding of it, they drive current performance as hard as anybody. They just would never try to get there by like cutting advertising or R&D or training or something that has long-term benefits. You know, if they miss in the short term, they miss in the short term. But in, in large public companies, we see this kind of game playing all the time where at the end of the quarter or at the end of the year, you know, they cut a little spending on this or a little bit on that. And, you know, yeah, sure, down the road is going to be a problem, but it helps me meet my number now. Owners, long-term committed owners would never do that. So, you know, Specifically, it's like a three to five year time horizon, but it's really that coupled with a strong focus on now, um, you know, a willingness to invest in the future, but a, a still a pursuit of strong performance, you know, in short and medium terms as well. Yeah, so they're not mutually exclusive right. ideals, right? We, we can right. focus on current uh, behaviors, current performance, but we, we just don't want to sacrifice long-term effectiveness and, and sustainability for short-term kind of faux gains. They're not even real gains, right? Because we're just kind of manipulating the numbers. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I guess then the question becomes, how do we start to shift uh, away from 
uh, a, an exclusively short-term kind of an approach and embrace more of that long-term approach while not completely jettisoning the, the short-term. Yeah, so again, the sort of wrapper around everything is this idea of an ownership culture where people think and act like long-term owners. And I'll come back to what that really means, uh, sort of the traits of an ownership culture, if you will. But to actually make it happen, you need several things. First of all, you need to align the basic business management processes of the company with this, this desire to create a, an ownership culture. Um, how people plan, how they make decisions, how they measure performance, all those things in many companies stand in the way of, of the real success. Um, I mean, I, just for example, one client that I worked with um, uh, almost a decade ago, uh, I remember the, the chief financial officer handed me a report you know, that was probably an inch thick. And it had all these little yellow stickies, like 50 or 100 yellow stickies sticking out of it on with little things written on them. And he was getting ready for the quarterly earnings call. And his team prepared this you know, book of backup material every quarter with all the detail on why, this, why they missed this, why they made that, and what they're doing here, what they're doing there. And I spoke to one of the people that worked for him, and she said to me, you know, I, we don't even have time to like scrutinize expense budgets because we spend, as soon as one quarter ends, we're preparing for the, the earnings call the next quarter. And, you know, it's just this obsession with short-term numbers. We did some really interesting research um, a few years back where we studied performance of companies uh, versus share price performance. And within an individual quarter, it matters a lot. If, if, uh, if a company beats or doesn't beat the, the analyst expectations. But as soon as you open it up to four quarters or eight quarters or 12 quarters, you know, one year, two years or three years, what matters much more is the improvement. Whether you meet or didn't meet the investor expectations didn't really matter. What matters was improvement. In fact, if you can keep beating investor expectations without improving, that means you're sandbagging your goals every year and, the, and, you know, and, the, and that doesn't end, end very well. So in the longer run, whether you do or don't beat you know, what the analysts think or you do or don't beat your guidance is not really important. What matters is overall improvement. So what that should lead people to do is be more willing to take a hit to the current quarter if they need to, to invest in something that might pay off three years from now. And that kind of getting that behavior to happen requires having, again, different ways of planning, different ways of, of making decisions, different ways of, of measuring people Otherwise, it's just talk, right? We just you tell yeah. people to act long term, but if none of the processes change, they're still <laughs> going to do what they've always done, you know. And when if you see the C-suite, you know, focusing on quarterly earnings reports exclusively, almost, <laughs> then of course that's what other people are going to focus on, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, like and that. I really, I really like your your focus on ownership mentality, ownership culture. I think that's wonderful. And I think a lot of organizations, probably most organizations try to foster that in some way, like they probably think, yeah, that's, that's something that is good conceptually, but the number of firms that actually do it in a meaningful way is probably pretty small. And it's one thing to say the C-suite, you know, senior executives are kind of bought in with this ownership culture versus middle managers all the way down the line to frontline workers. That's pretty rare, I think, uh, you know, for people to really, truly feel bought into this ownership culture. Um, what, tell us a little bit about your experience with that. And if, if, if you agree, like if, if we're really missing the mark and we're not, we're not uh, experiencing that as much as we could be in organizations, then the question becomes, what do we do about it? Like, how do we start to develop that ownership co culture? Right, right. Let me talk a little bit about some of the traits of an ownership culture first and then get back to the sort of how you get there. So uh, some years ago, my partners and I sat down and said, you know, what are the, the most important, you know, sort of traits? And, and we went through this big, long list that we brainstormed and we narrowed it down, narrowed it down. And in 2018, we wrote an article where we, we first sort of identified these traits and we've been using them over and over since. And we're actually writing a sequel to my current book, which will really emphasize these five traits. And let me just go through them quickly. The first one's kind of obvious. It's spend money like it's yours. And not that it's obvious inside many companies, people, you know, uh, spend their own money. I, the, the example I always use is, you know, somebody has a business trip to Europe, you know, three months ago, they went to Europe with their spouse, they flew economy, but now that they're going on the company's dime, they have to fly business class. You know, that's just, you know, treat the money like it's your own. If you can get people to think and act that way, that's the first step. The second one is really important. It's extreme prioritization. 
I love working with entrepreneurs because nothing that's unimportant really clouds their vision. They figure out the two or three or four really important things and everything else either doesn't get done or it gets delegated. And when I deal with corporate executives in large, more bureaucratic organizations, they have no time in their schedule because they have no ability to prioritize. Every different initiative, they have a meeting here, a meeting there. And, and, and so extreme prioritization is really important. But it also relates to how people allocate resources. You know, people have to allocate capital and innovation money and marketing money to their different businesses or different product lines. And what they really need to do is to think like Warren Buffett. Where am I really going to create the most value? That's where I want to put my money. Most people just sort of smear resources around the organization. We want more prioritization on the things that are really successful, a much more bias of investing in the good stuff. That's going to lead to more profitable growth and going to help the company to be healthier and more successful over time. The third principle is a willingness to fail. And this is a really big problem in most companies today. There's been this real emphasis on, you know, having positive variances to plan, positive continuous incremental improvement. And so nobody's ever willing to put anything in their plan anymore that they're not like 100% sure they can accomplish. That's not really good for innovation. We need some experimentation on things that we don't know are going to be successful. Entrepreneurs, you know, people that really have that long-term authentic ownership uh, stake tend to be much more willing to experiment and, and fail. And that's really important in being successful in business. The fourth one is more doing and less talking. And I actually have an article coming out uh, soon on this specific topic. But you know, analysis paralysis is a big problem in companies. They just can't make a decision. They end every meeting with, let's study this further. And you know, lots of times, uh, you know, private companies that I work with are just so much more decisive. You know, they realize that if something creates $1,000 of profit and it costs them $2,000 to make a decision, that's not really good. And so they're much more decisive. They, they, they clarify what their go, no go criteria are. And, you know, they just, they're, they're just they're much more doing, much less talking because they just are able to come to decisions with, with greater pace. And the last one is we already covered and it's about the long and the short term. We often talk about the problems of short termism. I mean, my book is all about curing corporate short termism. But I've worked with people that lean too far the other way too. And all they think about is the long term and they don't worry about ever really executing and delivering. And that can be just as big of a problem. So we really always need to recognize it's both. Now to get those five traits to come to life, again, it needs to become, it needs to be considered in how you plan, how you make decisions and how you measure performance. And one of the things you need to do that properly is a real good measure of success that is a single measure, not a scorecard of 20 measures. And you need to stop measuring it against plans. You need to start measuring it against last year. When it gets better, it's good. When it gets worse, it's bad. As soon as you decouple how you measure people's performance from the budgeting and planning process, the budgeting and planning process suddenly becomes incredibly useful because nobody's trying to sandbag to get easy goals for the year. They're more willing to stretch knowing they're not going to be held accountable for them, but they're a guide for planning and decision-making and so forth. They become more willing to experiment, more willing to shoot for the stars. And, you know, sometimes they don't make it, but I'd, you know, I'd rather aim for 10% growth and achieve 8% than aim for 2% growth and achieve three. And so, you know, the, 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 the business management processes need to support the, you know, this owner-like thinking. Yeah, I really like that. And, you know, it's one thing when you're a small startup, right. And you have your, your founding team and maybe, you know, you grow to, you know, five, 10, 20 people. It's mm -hmm. another thing entirely when you're growing to 50, a hundred, 200, 500, a thousand plus, right. You yeah. grow into these big companies and how do you continue to embed that kind of ownership mentality uh, into everybody, whether they're like the entry level person coming straight out of college uh, all the way up the line, right? And that's, that can be really challenging. Uh, and, and coming back to what you said, it really does depend largely on the embedded mechanisms within the institution, within the organization about how you're going to try to reinforce that kind of a culture. Uh, right. It's not, it's not enough to just say it to, you know, go to a meeting and have a big rah, rah session and say, yes, you're all owners. And, you know, we're so excited to have shared ownership and then nothing actually happens in the organization to reinforce it. Then of course, mm -hmm. that's not going to take hold. And, and that's what I see a lot of, I, I do see people expressing these kind of ideas, but, mm -hmm. but moving past the idea to actual implementation and systemic kind of change to reinforce and sustain the kind of culture that you're describing, 
uh, in, in a shift in orientation, you know, that that's harder to do. And so you just don't see as many organizations really doing that effectively. So how, what would you say in terms of how we could go about doing that, especially if we're talking about, say, say we've, we're scaling or we're, we're in the process of scaling or we have scaled and now we're a much larger organization and we still, we want to capture the secret sauce of like that ownership culture from the early days and carry it on throughout as we grow. Yeah. So it's, it, you know, it starts with defining success in, in, a, in a way that is, is very unambiguous and clear. You know, I, I mentioned these scorecards with multiple measures before. You know, in a lot of companies, you wind up with, a, a, with, with this analysis paralysis because, you know, somebody looks at a decision and they say, okay, if we make this investment, revenue growth is going to go up and, and return on capital is going to get better, but profit margin is going to get worse and free cash flow is going to get worse. You know, what do you do? You know, which ones of those things are more important? And the financial management of a company often, you know, is it's like uh, one of my former partners I worked with years ago used to say, it's like, it's like paint, you know, on an old house. It's just layer after layer. It's just adding, every time there's a hole in the, what's being measured, they add another measure. And before you know it, you've got this scorecard of a lot of things. And, you know, years ago, I, I worked at the Grumman Corporation and, and one of the CEOs um, was uh, notorious because we would submit to the board you know, investments for approval and there'd be like 10 metrics and nothing ever looked good on all 10 metrics. So, you know, we would, we would submit these and, you know, he would look at it. And if he liked the investment, he would point out the metrics that look good. And if he didn't like the investment, he would point out the metrics that look bad. And I used to always say to my boss, why don't we even do the analysis? Why don't we just ask John, which ones he wants to do, you know? Uh, but the, the, you know, it's, it's a, um, it, getting away from that to some kind of real clarity is tough. It's very hard. It's, and, uh, the a lot of the work on scorecards and so forth kind of made it even more of a mystery to people in terms of you know the clarity of decisions. So in our work, the most important sort of fundamental building block is a simple measure of profitability. It's a measure we call it residual cash earnings, but usually in practice it gets named after the client that's using it and gets customized for them. But in simple terms, it's like the cash that we generate minus an expected return on whatever we've invested in the business. You know, so if you invested, say, $50,000 of your money in the neighbor's business and you said, I want a 10% return, well, at the end of the year, they would take whatever profit they made and they would subtract 10% of 50,000, whatever's left over, that's the real value created over and above meeting your expected return. That simple measure captures growth, it captures margin improvements, it captures how much you invest in the business. And so when it goes up, it really is good. When it goes down, it really is bad. And so we stop measuring it against budgets because again, we don't want people to have an incentive to plan low. We just measure it against last year. Whenever it goes up, you get paid more. Whenever it goes down, you get paid less. That simple measure and that simple way of tying it into how people get paid and then aligning the planning and decision-making with that so that you know, people know how to use it to make decisions is, is really the key. Um, getting people to understand that and actually use it takes a lot of, you know, it's a change management process. You need communication, training, and so forth, so they know how to problem solve using new tools. But that having one simple measure that when it goes up, it's good, and when it goes down, it's bad, is the starting point for, for the, the change not being a bunch of platitudes about, well, this is the behavior we want, but actually getting people to know how to behave that way and know have the tools to behave that way. One um, change management consultant uh, working with one of our clients uh, was involved in some meetings with us recently. And, and after we went through how our whole framework works in a bit more detail than I just did, you know, she just looked up and said, wow, you know, every time we talk about this, it's just like platitudes of what we want, but you guys really back this up with substance. And that's, that's kind of the key. You can't just say, I want you to think long-term if all the systems are designed to encourage them to think short-term, you got to back right. it all up with, with what you do and even how you pay people. And once, but once you do, it's remarkable how things happen. I, I had a call an online roundtable recently with the CFO of Ball Corporation. Ball Corporation, they make uh, mostly like aluminum products, cans and cups and so forth. They also have a, a, an aerospace business, but they have um, uh, uh, been using a framework like ours for 30 years. They actually just passed their 30 year anniversary. And uh, Scott Morrison, the CFO was on an online roundtable with me recently. And you know, I asked him, so you know, how has this affected um, you know, your, your, your internal workings inside the company. And he said, well, it makes meetings shorter. 
Uh, there's like one measure we focus on when it goes up, it's good. When it goes down, it's bad. We don't end meetings with, oh, let's study this or oh, let's study that. If the measure gets better, it's good. If it gets worse, it's bad. And I think if you think about that in most big bureaucratic companies, what a breath of fresh air that would be, right? I mean, to have that kind of yeah. clarity driving the, the management process. Yeah, the analysis paralysis is a big problem. The scorecards, you know, on the one hand, it's it's a nice idea to, to say, we have these metrics, here's the scorecard, this, this is how we're gonna make our decisions. My experience has been that it's just faux objectivity, <laughs> usually, yeah. right? To, to your story earlier, like you, you pick and choose, you cherry pick the metrics that kind of support your argument. You mm -hmm. kind of wash over or ignore the ones that don't. Mm -hmm. um, and it's completely, in my experience, most of the time, it's very inconsistent on how those actually get applied to real decision-making. Uh, yeah. And if that's the case, people aren't stupid. Like they, they know that there's a game being played and they're going to play the game uh, because mm -hmm. they're going to want to try to get funding for their projects and initiatives and, you know, shore up, you know, the, the, the security of the jobs and their team and, you know, the, all those sorts of things. Right. Yeah. And so you just get more of playing the game rather than actually doing what's going to be necessary to help the organization succeed. And so many organizations do just get stuck in the analysis paralysis stage. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes they frame it as, well, we're just seeking consensus or, you know, we, we really just want to really understand uh, the problem before, you know, we, we want to aim before, you know, it's, it's, it's ready, aim, shoot, not ready, shoot, aim kind of an idea. Right. And, and while that certainly is a good idea and it's important and it's not like what the, the important thing is it's not one or the other it's not like you either ha are completely haphazard and have no planning whatsoever or mm -hmm. you take so long to reach a decision um that much of what you're trying to accomplish in the first place never gets done or it, mm -hmm. the decision's obsolete by the time you arrive right. at it right and 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 many people will fall back you know, they'll just punt repeatedly, they will punt decisions over and over and over again, because they're nervous about the political consequences of the decision they want to make, uh, or because, you know, it's, it's, they're just uncomfortable making the hard decision or whatever, right. And, and the thing is, when you get into a, the process of just being able to um, iterate rapidly through decision making, then you start to realize, like, if I can make decisions inform data-driven decisions, but make them on a rather rapid basis, that if I make a decision, it turns out to be wrong, and it's, it takes us down the wrong direction, guess what? You're not locked into it. You can change it, yeah. <laughs> and you can, yeah. you can make a new decision, and you can go the, the other direction. So it actually becomes part of being a learning organization, because now I think you do more learning that way than if when you're stuck in analysis paralysis, because I've been in those meetings where you're, you just... The meeting is pointless and you've had the same meeting mm -hmm. 10 times and right. you regurgitate the same garbage over and over and over again. People yeah. aren't paying attention. People aren't learning. People aren't stretching. They're, they're, they're going through the motions. And uh, so it, it, it really is this interesting, like juxtaposing the, the short term with the long term. Again, we just need to realize that they go together. And, yeah. and what you Absolutely. said earlier, you've actually said it a couple of times in our conversation is you, you need, you can't let planning um, happen to the detriment of action and performance. Mm -hmm. And so they, they need to go together. I, I, I think I'm a pretty analytical person. I'm, I tend to be a very prepared person, a long-term orientation person, but anyone who knows me knows I'm the guy that gets crap done. And, you know, if you need something done, um, work with John, he's going to help you get it done. And, I don't know what I'm doing all the time. I'm, I'm building the plane while I fly it. And, and I'm comfortable with the ambiguity and the, me the messiness, knowing that I'm sometimes going to get it wrong, but I'm going to learn through the process and I can still have my long-term kind of orientation and focus and goals. And what I'm doing in the short term is to try to get there, but I have mm -hmm. to act. I have to move forward. And if I don't, then I'm, I just, you just get stuck and then you lose yep momentum, you lose engagement, you lose excitement and passion, and all those things that you need for an organization to thrive get diminished. And, you know, you, you just become, the organization becomes a shell of its former self. You know, yeah. all the energy that was there in the, in the startup phase with the founding team, you know, goes away. And, and it's a really sad thing to see that. 
Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's a really what, good way to put it. If I could just uh, add one point uh, before we uh, wrap this up, I think it's um, one important thing that I wanted to mention. So a lot of times when we go down the path of a discussion like we just had, people get the impression that I'm mostly concerned about you know, financial performance. And obviously financial performance over the long term is very important. But I think to actually deliver it requires a company to start with a good strategy. And before even starting with that strategy, they need to be a company that operates with a, a, a good and a clear corporate purpose. And I just wanted to say quickly that we did some research a few years ago, which is really very interesting with regard to corporate purpose. Uh, a company called Barra Brand Management developed a battery of 13 questions in collaboration with the Jim Stengel company. And uh, these were questions about you know, different aspects of corporate purpose, like you know the, the, the they uh, believe in a principle I believe in, they stand up for society, you know, different things that are important to corporate purpose. And we studied companies that were um, rated high versus those that were rated below median on, on this corporate prefer, uh, purpose statistic. And what was really interesting was the companies that, that had, uh, were rated by consumers as having a higher purpose, had delivered more revenue growth, had higher profit margins, had higher returns on capital, had were valued at higher multiples of EBITDA and produced better share price performance than the companies that didn't. And that gap actually widened when, when, the, when the pandemic hit. Operating with corporate purpose actually even became more important during, uh, during this. So, you know, I just wanted to say at the end, uh, you know, we're very focused on delivering long-term financial success, share price performance improvement and so forth, but you don't get there without caring about all your stakeholders and operating with good purpose. So I just wanted to to weave that in at the end because it's an important well part said. Of message. Yeah, absolutely. And again, if we're talking about long-term sustainable growth, right, then you have to be a people-centric, purpose-driven organization. You have to focus on your customers. You have to focus on your people inside the organization, your employees. You have to think about other stakeholders and, and you have to be responsible to all of them not in the short term, but in the long term. And if you don't, yeah. you, you burn bridges and you're you're going to lose out. So absolutely, thank you for clarifying that because that that absolutely is a, is something I also feel very strongly about and passionate about. And again, it's not an either or. Like so often, we lay out this false dichotomy that you're either a numbers driven, heartless capitalist, or you like love people and you want people to excel and thrive and succeed. And mm -hmm. it, it like can be and should be both, yes. <laughs> you know, like you yeah. can make money while investing in your people. And the reality is if you invest in your people and treat them well, you'll make more money. If you have yeah. a purpose driven organization, does that take time, energy, effort, investment? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Will it pay off in, you know, in uh, huge amounts down the road? Yes, it will. So, yeah. you know, we want to do that just like any other ROI that we would look at for anything we do in our business. The, the ROI is clear. So we need to make sure we do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Completely agree. Yep. Well, Greg, it has been a real pleasure talking with you. We could go on and on, but I note the time I need to let you go. Before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you uh, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Sure. So my email is gregory.milano at fortuna-advisors.com. If you uh, Google me, you'll find our website. Uh, and uh, my final word is just, I think it's really important for all companies to think about their culture of their organization, and to think about how you get the most out of the culture for all the different stakeholders. And you know, we happen to think the most the, the best way to do that is by creating an ownership culture where people you know authentically think like long-term committed owners. It's just it's best for everybody. I love it. Thank you, Greg. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Greg can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.